we actually know very little about Aristotle's life. We know the bare bones facts, the dates. So let me start with those. Aristotle was born in 384 and he died in 322. Of course, that's BCE. Uh, the most important facts that I can think of, most relevant for beginning to think seriously about Aristotle are these. First and foremost, his father was the court physician in the north. He's not from Athens, he's from Stagira. Uh, the fact that Aristotle's father was a doctor strikes me as uh, pervasively interesting in Aristotle because Aristotle himself is so, uh, is so oriented to biology and so often thinks in terms of a medical paradigm. So he grew up with a doctor. Um, Next really important fact about Aristotle's life is that at age 17, it's the year 367, he comes south to Athens. Athens in the fourth century was no longer the great political and military power that it had been in the previous century, in the fifth century BCE, but it was nonetheless still the intellectual center of the Greek world. Uh, we're in Boston right now, of course, and we in Boston often like to think of ourselves this way. Uh, we're, we're the home of universities. We're, New York is money. Hollywood is films. Washington, D.C. is political power. Boston is, is schools, and that's what Athens was in the fourth century. So, age 17, Aristotle comes to Athens. He studies in Plato's Academy. It was the name of the school, of course, the root of our word, academic. He studies with Plato for 20 years. There's some uh, thought that uh, when Plato died, Aristotle was very offended that he was not made the next director of the school. This is shrouded in mystery, we don't know for sure. What we do know, and again, I think very interesting, is that in 343, he goes back north and he becomes the tutor of Alexander the Great. So he does that for a year. He doesn't come back to Athens until 335. And at that point, he sets up his own school, known as the Peripatetic School of Philosophy. To be honest, the best, def the best biography I ever read of Aristotle was one sentence long. Aristotle was born, he thought, he died. Uh, he's that kind of thinker. Uh, Another legend, which I find curious and intriguing, but could possibly be substantiated, is that he was a very nice dresser. Uh, why he would have enjoyed good clothes, I don't know, but uh, that's what we hear. He was famous for his rings, apparently. I don't think that's very significant and certainly can't be verified. The really difficult question and, and the important question, one that's preoccupied scholars for thousands of years, is the intellectual influence and relationship, the influence Plato had on Aristotle and then the, re the relationship between them. We know nothing about the personal relationship, or at least I know nothing and I'm quite confident I'm not alone. The legend is he had the nickname nous, which in Greek means mind. Uh, he must have been uh, a giant even at age 17. And for me, this is enduringly fascinating to think about. Um, uh, it, I'm very tempted, it's, it's almost irresistible to think of it in somewhat uh, edible terms. I mean, uh, Plato was his father, his intellectual father. In the deepest possible sense, Aristotle was influenced by Plato. At the same time, like every good son, he fought against his father. Uh, the, the, the famous image of all of this that you often see on websites of many philosophy departments is Raphael's painting of the philosophers in Athens. In the middle of the painting, one sees Socrates and he's pointing up, reflecting not just Socrates, but also Plato's, uh, you might say, interest in the transcendent, uh, the purely intellectual, uh, what is often called by scholars Plato's theory of forms. Aristotle has his hand level. And as cliched and familiar an image as that is, it nonetheless is very informative in my mind. Uh, Aristotle is very level-headed. He is profoundly interested in the world. Uh, that single world comes to my mind whenever I think about Aristotle. Uh, and all I mean by world is 
what I see outside of me, I, the, the biological realm, uh, the stars, the animals, the other human beings, the, the political institution these other in, human beings make, the things other human beings write. Aristotle is interested in all of it. Plato equally interested in, in, in a certain sense in the world. Nonetheless, I, uh, one way of putting it is to say Plato much more influenced by mathematics than Aristotle. Mathematics, the study of pure form, what the purely intelligible reality, a reality that's never instantiated in any uh, particular material thing. For Aristotle, intelligibility in some very complicated sense, and this is really articulated most fully in his book titled The Metaphysics, is somehow located in material things, in the things we see and touch with our hands. That to me is the battle Aristotle is always fighting. And I do find it a battle. Uh, he has these platonic impulses, and yet he is, perhaps influenced by his biological father, interested in the human body and, and the bodies all around him, of not just human beings, but animals and plants. Very deeply fascinated by that, always. And there's another way, I think, to put this wonderful and wonderfully productive tension between Plato and Aristotle. It all has to do with the word form. It's a crucial word, not just in Greek philosophy, but in the history of philosophy. Um, a form, the Greek word is eidos. It derives from the verb to see. Literally, a form is the visible shape of something. It's what it looks like. You can almost translate the word form simply as the look of a thing. It comes to mean, especially for Plato, what is intelligible in an, in an object. Um, a form is what unifies an object. You're sitting in a chair. There are many parts. It has matter, but it has a structure. It has a shape. It has a form. When I enter the room, I see what it is immediately. I see it is a chair. I see it because it looks like a chair. Uh, as simple as that. Um, and that's as a result of that, I sit in the chair, I don't sit on the table. Uh, for Plato, form, again, I would say inspired by mathematics, has a very uh, almost uh, pure and distant relationship to the material things that we encounter with our senses. For Aristotle, in some, again, extremely complicated way, forms are in things. They're, they're literally in them. The primary example of this will always be, for Aristotle, an animal, an animal. I mean, I look at a squirrel outside you know, my window. I'm seeing a, a, a piece of matter that's running around. Uh, I see it as an individual. It's gray. It's located over there. It's, it's running very fast. But even as I look at that squirrel, I see it not simply as an individual. I see it as a squirrel. It's a member of a species. And that's, that very simple way of putting it is very telling for Aristotle. And again, you'll, as we, you know, anytime one gets into a conversation about Aristotle, I think inevitably we start talking about biology. Uh, this is the paradigm case for him. Uh, any organism is never simply an individual. It's always a member of a species. And in fact, the word species, which is a Latin word originally, is another way of translating this word, eidos, form. For Aristotle, material things, things that we access by our senses, are informed. Literally, the form is in. One way of explaining this is to refer to the very first couple of paragraphs in his book, The Metaphysics. Aristotle begins that book by saying, all human beings by nature desire to know. He takes that right away to be a key feature of our species. One might say it's the nature of eagles to fly high into fish. It's the nature of uh, lions to be fierce uh, warriors. Uh, it's the nature of human beings to know. He supports that statement by then shifting right away to the senses, something I believe Plato would never have done. He says, an evidence for this comes from the fact that we enjoy our senses, all five of them. We enjoy them and we value them for one pretty obvious reason. They help us live. I mean, as you're crossing the street, you'll be very grateful you have eyes 
you won't get run over. If you are looking for food, again, you'll be grateful you have eyes and a sense of smell. You can find the food, you can tell if it's rotten. Those are instrumental values of the senses and they're of course undeniable. But what Aristotle says is that we sometimes value our senses simply for themselves, even if there's no payoff or no consequence. On many occasions, each one of us will simply stop and enjoy a look or a smell or the feel of the wind or the way something can be touched. For Aristotle, that's a very important clue. There's something about our senses that please us and are important to us. He then goes on to develop a, an account of how we come by knowledge. And he says, he compares us to other animals. He points out that all animals have senses of some kind. Um, minimally, they have the sense of touch. They need that in order to be alive. Then he goes on to say, uh, and here he's probably, well, he may not be right, not all animals have memory. Those who do have memory can retain what impressions they've gotten from their senses. The next step from that is what he calls experience. Somehow, some animals, of course, human animals among them, are able to coagulate, to collect their memories into something like an organized unit. Um, he's, he's rather vague, actually, about this word, which is almost always translated as experience. Uh, in Greek, the word is empiria, which is the root of our word empirical. And so, of course, Aristotle is an empiricist. Somehow, beginning with the senses, going through memory, reaching empiria, experience, we start to organize our, our world, our experience of the world, into intelligible unities. The next step in the development of knowledge is, again, I'll repeat this word somehow because uh, the steps of this process are monumentally hard to articulate. And indeed, that's the main task of reconstructing Aristotle's various theories. We somehow are able to extract from experience, again, the crucial word, the form or the universal. So you've had many encounters perhaps with squirrels in your backyard. Uh, especially when you were a child, you, you had no scientific knowledge of squirrel, but you start to become familiar with this species so that if you see a new squirrel, squirrel you've never met before, you can make some pretty secure predictions about its behavior. At some point in your life, if you decide, as Aristotle did, to become a scientist, you would study the species squirrel. You would become a squirrelologist. And to do that requires you to study not individuals, but the universal or the species or the form. Squirrelness, again, odd term. The, the key point I want to make here, and your question was about uh, Aristotle's relationship to Plato, uh, this I think is very decisive for Aristotle. The, the entire process of gaining knowledge, his developmental account of knowledge, his genetic account of knowledge, begins with the senses. He's an empiricist in that classic sense. Again, it's a, it's a bit too crude, but it's also helpful perhaps. Aristotle's an empiricist, Plato is, is a rationalist. Uh, I, I think that that's, that's fair to say it that way. A medieval philosopher like Thomas Aquinas is an absolutely great reader of Aristotle. This is, a, yeah, this is a very basic battle throughout the Middle Ages, not just with Christian philosophers, but with Jewish and, and, and Muslim philosophers. In many ways, and I'll focus here more on, on Thomas Aquinas, there's a tremendous amount of compatibility between Thomas's view of the world, especially the natural world, and Aristotle's. I mean, in this sense, Thomas is an Aristotelian. The really pivotal uh, dividing points between them are on, number one, the notion of the creation of the world. For Aristotle, the world has always been here. God did not create the world. Building on that idea, for Aristotle does have a, a, a sense of God. We hear about this famously in book Lambda, book 12 of Aristotle's Metaphysics, where he, he argues on behalf of the existence of a single God, um, but that God is, is utterly different from the God of the Christians, the God of the Jews and the Muslims. That God is, has no 
personal qualities or moral qualities whatsoever. Aristotle describes God in a very mysterious formulation as thought thinking itself. God does not love. God does not love us. God has no special feelings for us whatsoever. Um, at this point, the sense of divergence with biblical religions is, is very profound. Nonetheless, I think uh, uh, Thomas would say simply using one's rational capacities as, as best as one can, as a good Christian or as a good human being, one would follow Aristotle almost all the way till the top, where you get these very basic forms of disagreement. Uh, of course, for Aristotle, God is not triune, uh, an important doctrine in Christianity, although one very much contested right, and, and hard to understand. Uh, none of those things make sense to Aristotle. I think, by and large, Thomas understands this and would say many of these questions, in fact, can't be settled by reason. They do require faith. So to put the point somewhat simply, I think Thomas, as a good Catholic, would say, we can go with Aristotle almost as far as, as he goes. And at some point, we will have to stop and, and draw a line. And at that point, we may be more relying on faith than we will be on reason. Reason uh, for Aristotle, and I think, again, I would refer to the metaphysics. I mean, for, in Aristotle's view, uh, the world, what we would call the universe, all makes sense. It's a, an enormously intelligible place. And one way of describing why the world makes sense for Aristotle is that things in the world have their place. So rocks, heavy objects, belong here on Earth. That's the natural place of a rock. Stars are made of a different element. They belong upstairs in the sky, and they don't fall down. Uh, human beings occupy their place, as do my friends, the squirrels. That's a view that's very compatible with, with what Thomas, with Thomas's view, that the world makes sense. And for both Aristotle and for Thomas, for, and I think for many other religious philosophers of the Middle Ages, that good sense of the world all ultimately points to, an, to an, a, a unifying ordering principle, which we in the biblical tradition would call God. Uh, sometimes I think actually the better translation for Aristotle, to theon, would be the divine, and use that word exactly to strip away some of the connotations we would have. But um, Aristotle, uh, Thomas would applaud, uh, did applaud Aristotle mightily for this fundamental insight which he shares. The world makes sense. Aristotle's surviving works are largely lecture notes. I'm actually not entirely convinced of that. Uh, surely some of the writings are notes of some sort. I'm not sure they were designed for lectures. Uh, some of the writing, by contrast, is very polished, and we, we're really not sure of the status of these writings. But lecture notes, uh, safe enough. The Nicomachean Ethics of, of all his books, I think, does have a very tight unity. I, probably in a minority in saying that. I think in its own way, it's a very carefully written work. But independent of the writing question, the fundamental idea in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is the idea of arete, or excellence. It's usually translated as virtue. Uh, I'm very uh, wary of the word virtue only because it's a word that most American English speakers would use only in a philosophy class. Aristotle's Greek is never like that. He's using very ordinary Greek words in his, in his, uh, in his works. Arete is excellent. I can speak of the excellence of your chair or the excellence of your watch. Um, that's the key notion. So let me very briefly explain how he gets there, if I can. Uh, Aristotle begins, as he so often does, as a good empiricist, and he notices something that he takes to be very obvious about human behavior. When we act, we act for a reason. We act aiming for some good. Uh, you and I agreed to come to this room today. We both had a reason. We both thought it was good for us to be here. Uh, who knows what those reasons are? The example I will, of course, always give to my students is, I say to my students, you're, you're here because you think it's good to be here. No one's forcing you to be here. 
um, but you're here. The next thing he notices, of course, rather obviously true, is, is this notion of goods or reasons tends to be hierarchical. I come into the room, I, a student, come into the classroom because I want to get a good grade. And then I push the student a little bit harder and I say, well, why do you want a good grade? Well, I have another good I hope to achieve. I want to be accepted into law school. Why do you want to be accepted into law school? I have another good I want to achieve. So it's sequential and hierarchical, the list, if you will, of goods. Aristotle then asks a very simple question. He says, does this sequence come to an end? And here I think he makes a very, again, typically Aristotelian argument, he, he says, well, let's imagine if it didn't come to an end. If it didn't come to an end, our desire, our life would be, he says, empty and futile. Uh, and that would be for one simple reason. If I do X for the sake of Y and Y for the sake of Z and it just goes on infinitely, then no step I take would ever advance me closer to my ultimate end. And he thinks, Aristotle thinks, that would render life meaningless. He then simply observes that most human beings uh, don't act that way at all. There are a few who do, but the vast majority don't. And he can infers from that that it must come to an end. There must be what he calls a highest good. What is the highest good? He says, another easy question, really, to answer. You, you ask anybody, sophisticated people, uneducated people, they'll tell you the same thing. It's happiness. Happiness is the one thing which, if I ask you, why do you want to be happy, you'll answer, because I want to be happy. It's an end in itself. If I ask you, why are you washing dishes in a restaurant, you'll answer, because I want my paycheck on Friday. I actually hate this work. The only reason I'm here is to make the money. Happiness is different. It's the highest end. It's the good in itself. Next question. So far, so good, one might say. It all sounds very plausible. We have to understand what happiness is. Well, how do we figure that out? This is the most controversial move that Aristotle makes. I think here is where students find it less easy to follow. He said, if we want to understand what happiness is, we need to understand what he calls the function of human being is. The Greek word is ergon, E-R-G-O-N can be translated as function, as work, as deed, as activity. The question he's asking, and this is the, precisely the kind of question a biologist would ask, in the human animal, in the human species, what work makes us into what we are? What is most characteristic of us? Well, his answer is rational activity, activity that has logos, that wonderful Greek word which means reason, Discourse, speech, means many other things as well. It's rational activity that is our essential and characteristic function. Now, from all of this, Aristotle will eventually cobble together a definition of happiness. He'll say happiness is actualizing this capacity or function that we have to the maximum extent. That's our attempt. So, in short, if you are engaged in excellent rational activity, you are happy. That's eudaimonia, the Greek word, which I think is important to introduce because this conception of happiness is very different from ordinary American conception of happiness. For us, happiness is a feeling, it's subjective, uh, it's, it's a matter to make a, an etymological connection of a kind of happenstance. Uh, I happen to be happy today. Uh, for Aristotle, happiness is an achievement, and it's an objective achievement. If you spend 12 hours a day sleeping, uh, it's irrelevant to Aristotle how cheerful you are or how satisfied you feel. Uh, you're not happy. You're not actualizing your, your capacities in an excellent way. So most uh, thinkers today would not embrace this conception of happiness, but that really is Aristotle's notion. So now we have a couple of things on the table. We have this notion of arete, or virtue, and we have this notion of rational activity, uh, the excellence of which is happiness. Uh, the, everything I've said covers just the first couple of chapters of book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. 
the bulk of the work, the next nine and a half books of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, is about articulating what those excellences are and what this excellent actualization of our rational capacity could be. Because for Aristotle, uh, there are many ways to be rational, and that will implicate him in a, in a very long and comprehensive survey of what it is to lead an excellent human life. Uh, this conception, you used the phrase moral philosophy. I actually think the phrase moral philosophy is a tiny bit misleading in thinking about the Nicomachean ethics. Uh, in a very important sense, Aristotle's not a moral philosopher. He's certainly not a moral philosopher uh, in the sense of a Hume or a Kant uh, or a Mill, uh, especially Kant and Mill. I mean, their fundamental question tends to be, what is the moral thing for me to do? How do I define a moral action? Uh, Aristotle is much closer, I believe, in the Nicomachean Ethics to being an anthropologist. He's giving an account of the of anthropos, of human being, of human nature, and how we, uh, what we are like at our very, very best. Um, so when one studies that book carefully, I think that's what we are learning. Aristotle, among his many achievements, because in essence Aristotle invented the university as we understand it, he invented logic as we understand it, even though it's gone through great transformations. Um, Early on, his, his, what we would now count as his logical works were collected into a kind of package and named, not by him, the organon. The organon means, is an instrument, a tool. Uh, so the organon would have been construed as a tool or instrument for science. Uh, and this is a very... Uh, wide-ranging topic, and I'll only briefly mention a couple of things. Uh, one of the works contained in the Organon is the categories. The categories is a study of predication, I would say, first and foremost. Another is a, a work which we usually, we use the Latin title De Interpretatione, uh, the, the most famous uh, logical contribution of that text is a study of various forms of opposition, contraries, contradictories. Um, another work, posterior analytics, a study of demonstrative science, and that would fall largely the deductive method that you were referring to. That's a notion of science as beginning in first principles and a set of, 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 of theorems, if you will, that get generated from those first principles. Uh, the prior analytics, a study of the syllogism, the famous forms of the syllogism. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Uh, the last uh, element or the last uh, work in the Organon is called the Topics, another sort of massive and sprawling work, which is a study, I think we would say, of informal reasoning, including uh, a kind of appendix to it, which focuses on what we would call fallacies. Uh, so it's a sprawling corpus uh, even inside the Organon. Um, but yes, uh, Ar Aristotle's achievements, uh, to use a word which has been stolen from my generation by young people, is genuinely awesome in the sense that it's unbelievable that he could have done that. I mean, he, he thought about everything, including in the case of the Organon, he thought about thinking and how one thinks well, how one thinks badly, how one argues. He wrote another book, not counted as part of the Organon, but related to it, on rhetoric, which is a massive study of different forms of rhetorical persuasion. Um, so this is part of his great legacy. Thinking about Aristotle's politics is a wonderful way to think about our own sense of politics. It's going to be by contrast, of course. By saying human being is by nature political, what Aristotle means is, again, I would point to biology as a clue. It's part of our nature to enter into political communities. If you recall, I said earlier in discussing the Nicomachean Ethics that uh, Aristotle asks, what is our ergon, our function? And our function is rational activity. Uh, that's a translation of this word logos. Logos has many meanings. 
One of the things it means is simply discussion, talking, language. Uh, Aristotle makes a point of this early on in his treatise, The Politics. Uh, Aristotle says, and many scientists today would disagree, human beings are the only animals that have logos, have language. Other animals have voice, he says. Voice can, inter, can, can indicate pleasure and pain. But what logos can do, and animals, he says, can't do this, is indicate what's good or bad, what's right or wrong. That natural capacity is very instructive to Aristotle. We are biologically wired to enter into discussions with one another. This is, in a nutshell, I think, what he means by being political. Um, but to put real emphasis on this notion by nature, uh, when Aristotle says that, we can infer from that is, uh, it's perfectly possible for a human being to live without a political community. You can imagine somebody on an island. You can imagine an individual who doesn't give a, a hoot about anything that's going on in the newspapers. Uh, such a person may spend all day in his apartment uh, listening to music. Uh, for Aristotle, such people are deficient. They are almost literally not fully human. Is a wonderful saying, which is, a human being without a city, without a polis, polis is the root of our word political, is either a beast or a god. Gods don't need cities. It's not in their nature to need a city. Animals are not political. They don't have language. But us, as the animals we are, we are intrinsically and basically political. The reason why I find it uh, very uh, stimulating to think about that, and especially to teach it, to discuss it with students, is because that's a view that's almost utterly at odds with our contemporary sensibility. Uh, the best way to describe our contemporary political sensibility is to use the word liberal. A dangerous word, I don't mean it by referring to Democrats. Uh, I mean political philosophers for whom liberty and individuality and the protection of individual human rights is the foremost objective of the state. And that, as, as uh, superficial as that characterization is, that covers a great deal of territory in describing modern political theory. Aristotle is no liberal. He doesn't take that sense of individuality to be fundamental for a political organization. Um, one way to put this, another sort of easy catchphrase, a thinker like Mill might say that anything that the state does not tell me not to do, I can do. The state tells me I can't rob people and steal their property. Well, I can't rob people and steal their property uh, without fear of punishment. But the state doesn't tell me a thing about what music I listen to or when I should wake up or what I should eat. That's up to me. That's the realm of individual choice. And it should be, says Mill. Aristotle would almost flip that. It's anything that the state doesn't tell me to do, I shouldn't do. The state is responsible for inculcating, to use the word we, we used when we were talking about the ethics, virtue. Right? The state has responsibilities for making its citizens better people. That's not the conception of the state that we now live in. Uh, so again, easy example I like to give for students. I happen to believe that it's good to wake up early and have a healthy, wholesome breakfast. Right? I think Aristotle could imagine a law which says you have to wake up early and have a healthy, wholesome breakfast. That, that's inconceivable, of course, in the United States of America, and perhaps it should be. Uh, Aristotle, I think, in this one is profoundly uh, controversial and should be very provocative. But back to your question, you asked, what does it mean to say that we're a political animal? This is what it means. We're not fundamentally individuals. I think that conception of individuality uh, is simply not Aristotelian. It's not Greek in general. It's not pagan. And ultimately, I think it's a Christian notion, uh, historically, not, not a, a pagan one. So that is, that's what I would largely uh, gloss on the question of the political animal. Aristotle invented biology for all practical purposes, as he invented so much. Uh, he was a titanic 
student of the living world. Uh, his biology uh, lasted till the 19th century. I mean, he, of course, invented, you might say, physics. Uh, physics, his physics gave way to modern physics, of course, around the scientific revolution, 1600. But his biology held sway in important ways until Darwin. I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't have great fluency in the details. I've talked to biologists. May, Aristotle was an extraordinarily good observer. So he loved uh, marine biology, and that, by the way, helps us date some of his works. We have some idea of where he might have been that would have given him access to these kinds of animals that he wrote about. So he writes a book, The Parts of Animals, Comparative Zoology or Comparative Anatomy, uh, Historia Animalium, The Inquiry into Animals. Uh, very controversial and difficult to say precisely what kinds of theories these are. Sometimes they seem to be a compilation of, of observations rather than an overarching theory. Um, I would say, coming back to a theme that can't be repeated enough, for Aristotle, the primary notion is form. Here, let's translate eidos as species. Uh, the biological world is organized, it's intelligible. There's no such thing as a radically individual organism. An organism is both an individual in a particular space at a particular time, as well as a member of a species. This is something that is, is primordial in Aristotle's thinking. The other notion we need to introduce here, and this is the one that gets the most press these days, is the notion of teleology comes from the word telos, T-E-L-O-S. Translating it into English means end, purpose, or goal. Uh, the word end is, is nicely ambiguous in both English and Greek. End means the end of this session may occur at 2 p.m. It also means the goal. The end of one's education is, not, is to graduate, is to gain some knowledge. Aristotle sees the biological world in particular, in fact, I think he sees the whole world as structured teleologically. The structures come, the teleological structures come from the species. So very simply, uh, you and I are human beings. Uh, we have many, many differences. Uh, historically, we're different ages. We grew up in different places. We have uh, different histories, of course. What impresses Aristotle far more than that is what we have in common. We're the same members of the same species, which is why, of course, a doctor could treat you or me, never having met you or me before, a doctor knows what to expect. You're a human being, I'm a human being. Our, our form gives us our telos. Uh, the, the form of an animal, and in the book, The Physics, which is Aristotle's study of nature, not simply physics, as you and I would understand it today, uh, he conceives of what he calls four causes. Four causes or four explanations. The Greek word here is aitia, still found in the English word etiology. A cause, I think, is a bit uh, deceptive here. Uh, it, you and I use the word cause in ordinary English or sophisticated intellectual English. What we mean is a mechanical cause, that, that my hand caused the motion of this pen as it was moving across the page. That's certainly one of Aristotle's causes, but he conceives of other causes, other explanations. One is what he calls the formal cause. The formal cause is an answer to a certain question, what is it? So I ask about the being sitting in front of me, what is it? Answer, human being, that's its species its form, that's, it. that's the formal cause. I can also ask about the being in front of me, what's it made of, what is its stuff? That's its material cause. You're made of calcium and blood and water, these are the kinds of elements Aristotle would have identified. Um, I can of course also ask about what he calls the efficient cause. What put you in that chair uh, in the preceding time segment? That's the most familiar cause of all. The cause that um, jumps off the page and that really distinguishes Aristotelian science from modern science is the final cause. And that, as you're hearing, all the causes are, in a sense, answers to questions. The final cause answers the question, 
For the sake of what? For the purpose of what? Aristotle believes that to understand any being, any being in this universe, you have to answer all four questions. We only have one, maybe two left, the efficient and the material. But it's the formal cause that Aristotle, uh, excuse me, the formal and the final cause that Aristotle thinks are most crucial. I would say that's his great contribution to biology, and it's also the most anachronistic part of his biology. Um, the notion that the biological world is neatly divided into species, this is now challenged by many biologists and philosophers of biology, and the, and the notion that the form uh, gives the organism its telos, its direction. It, back to an earlier question, you asked about Thomas Aquinas and the other medieval philosophers who relied on Aristotle to give a, a theoretical infrastructure to their religious views. Uh, they're very big on teleology. They're very big, of course, on the notion that beings have a purpose. For them, for a religiously minded uh, thinker, broadly speaking, God gives the, these beings its purpose. There, there is no such God in Aristotle. It's nature that gives purposes. Uh, it's part of our nature to be political. It's part of our nature to be rational. That's our tell us. And Aristotle's uh, works, as you mentioned earlier, were preserved through the Arabs and transmitted rather quickly into the West, translated into the West. Plato doesn't get fully translated until 200 years after the Scholastics. So it's just what books are available. Uh, most of the Scholastics did not read Greek. Um, so, but they did get their Latin translations of Aristotle fairly early on. Could it have been Plato? Uh, that's another question uh, one could speculate. What appealed to them about Aristotle? Well, I think many of the same things we've been talking about. The notion of a world that makes sense, uh, a notion of beings, especially animals, that have purposes, the notion of directionality. The world is such that if properly understood, can be understood as pointing in a, in a certain direction. Uh, unlike biblical thinkers, for Aristotle, there's directionality, but there's no director. There's no personal director. He has this enormous um, faith, that's a dangerous word, in nature. If you've ever known a biologist, a serious natural scientist, an astronomer, really so many natural scientists, what so often characterizes them is an utter love of, of, of nature. Uh, and Aristotle is in that camp. Nice saying, which he actually probably borrows from Plato, philosophy begins in wonder. And we wonder at the world, especially the living world, especially those organisms that are closest to us, namely animals, although he is interested in plants. Uh, all of it for him points ultimately to the truth. And the truth is a truth which does include the conception of God. Again, can't say this strongly enough. Uh, God is very important to Aristotle, but God is basically not recognizable uh, from a biblical perspective. Um, very difficult to say just what Aristotle means by God. I, I wouldn't try. Even today, I would say, many religious-minded thinkers can get a lot of ammunition from Aristotle. You might think, for example, of the passionate debates uh, going on now about the teaching of evolutionary theory in school. Many oppose it. They have an alternative doctrine, which they call intelligent design. For them, the world, biological world, is simply too complicated to be explained mechanically. And some notion of design must be included in a proper scientific account of the biological world. I think the, their arguments are actually extremely weak on, us, on scientific grounds. But the intuition would be very Aristotelian, that we cannot give a complete account of animals without referencing some form of teleology, some form of directionality. Aristotle, you might say, is, is located somewhere in between intelligent design and Darwin. Darwin is the naturalistic doctrine. Intelligent design, although they often claim not to be, are really very theistic. Aristotle is a naturalist, but a proponent of teleology and directionality, I would say. That's what makes him, I, I would suggest, so compatible with many, many religious thinkers.
The way I would start to explain Aristotle's relevance today is somewhat indirect. Um, in, in 1935, a philosopher named Edmund Husserl wrote a small essay, gave a lecture, which was titled The Crisis of the European Sciences. And in that essay, uh, he develops a critique of modern Western rationality. When philosophers, historians of philosophy, use the word modern, they're essentially identifying it with the kinds of science that were developed beginning approximately 1600. In a nutshell, modern science is characterized by its essential relationship to mathematics. The paradigm of modern science is mathematical physics. Husserl, certainly as every rational person must, understands the power of mathematical physics. But he has a profound worry, and that's the reason he uses the word crisis. He worries that in a, a modern European Western world, and of course now it's a global conception of science, in which mathematical physics is the paradigm, something is going to be lost. And what that is, one might say, he doesn't quite say it so simply, Husserl says nothing simply, is human experience. Human beings experience the world from a human perspective. Simplest example here would be uh, the fact that as sophisticated as our knowledge of astronomy might be, we will always experience the sun as moving from east to west across the sky. We say to ourselves, I know the sun's not moving. I know the earth is rotating around the sun, and I know the earth is not stationary. Sure, it feels stationary, sure, it looks stationary. It's impossible, actually, for it to feel or be perceived otherwise. Um, now, mentioning these things, because what Husserl devised is a conception of philosophy to which he gave the name phenomenology. That's as are so many interesting words derived from Greek words. The first bit is phenomena, phenomenon, which in Greek means that which appears, that which seems to us, that which, the way the world is given to us in ordinary experience. The example of the sun moving through the sky is very suitable for that, as is our ordinary language, which Again, no matter how sophisticated you are, you're certainly going to tell me that the sun will rise at 6.35 a.m. It's a misnomer from a technical point of view. The sun's not actually rising, but we feel it that way, we see it that way, we say it that way, we experience it that way. What Husserl wants to do is, is restore the phenomena to seriousness. He wants a kind of science that takes the phenomena to be evidence evidence of a kind of truth, part of a very serious scientific enterprise. Now, that's a long-winded introduction to Aristotle. Husserl's teacher was a guy named Brentano. Brentano was a great Aristotle scholar as well as a Thomist. In my mind, what makes Aristotle so relevant today, even though on the one hand he's dead as a doornail, is he's a genius at phenomenology. Let me, let me suggest the following. Imagine you're a scientist, your job is to be a scientist, but here are the rules. You are not allowed to use telescopes, you're not allowed to use microscopes, you're not allowed to use essentially any tools whatsoever except maybe a knife in order to cut up some animals. You are restricted to your naked eye and the observations you can make with your naked eye. If that was a game you were willing to play, what you'd be left with are the phenomena as your evidence for your scientific theories. That's Aristotle. Aristotle is, in my estimation, the greatest single articulator of the structures, the nature of human experience. Is he wrong? Of course he's wrong. He thinks he's a geocentrist. He thinks the Earth is the center of the universe. It's not. Yes, it is. It will always be the center of our world, our experience always, unless we move to another planet, which might be possible someday, but is not now. Aristotle believes that species are fixed and stable. They don't change. He's wrong. Darwin clearly demonstrated that. On the other hand, he's right. Uh, you certainly treat your dog, whom you love, as a dog. You don't treat your dog 
as a former wolf that was domesticated over a period of 25,000 years. Uh, we treat each other, we treat our animal friends as if their being has some real ontological integrity. That's what Aristotle, I mean, that, that's the way the world presents itself to us at face value, you might say. What we've learned through modern science, and it's the absolute obsession these days of psychologists and social psychologists, is they're also absolutely sure we're wrong about everything in our common sense view of the world. Uh, they take such pleasure in puncturing these balloons. To me, this is, I agree with Husserl, a crisis. I think we're gonna become incredibly smart people. We already are clever. We figure out all kinds of nifty machines that uh, are impressive. But I believe that we're losing sight rapidly of what it means to be a human being and to be on this planet with these animals right now. I think we've truly lost sight of that. And as a result, we're imperiled. For me, that's reason to return to Aristotle.